Thanks, I hope everybody's nice and awake. Um, so, uh, my name is Ryan Muller. Uh, I work at uh, Novartis, um, basically across the street here. Um, I'm a software engineer there, and I write software that helps the scientists there in their research. Uh, my talk today is about BaconJS, uh, functional reactive programming, and how you can leverage it in your applications along with Backbone. Um, so, I'm just going to, how many of you are familiar with functional programming? How many of you like it? That's pretty good. How many of you don't like it? Oh, good. I picked the right audience then. Um, so, basically, the official definition uh, from Wikipedia is that it's a paradigm that treats computation, blah, 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 blah. Um, the easier definition is that functional programming is a style of programming where functions take input and produce output without changing anything outside those functions. Um, so here's a, a quick code sample of showing the difference between uh, functional and imperative styles. Uh, this is sort of the Java version, if you like, uh, where you sort of uh, keep track of state yourself and um, you're keeping track of state in the sum variable and the i variable, and we're just sort of looping over it. Um, whereas on the right, we have uh, we're using reduce instead, um, where it's much more declarative. We're just sort of specifying what we want to do and just sort of letting our uh, our reduce function take care of how we actually want to do it. Uh, if you really want to see some differences between these two styles. Um, you can find some code that's been written in Java and in Scala, for instance, because uh, both of those programs or both of those languages um, encourage a very different style of programming. So my example has the main difference between imperative and functional programming. In functional programming, which is declarative, the focus is on what you want to do, whereas in imperative, the focus is on how you want to do it. Um, so in 2010, um, you got underscore 1.0. Uh, which brought this very wonderful vocabulary for operating over collections to JavaScript. Um, and we could suddenly um, operate over our collections using just uh, this vocabulary instead of having to keep track of it and do all the legwork ourselves. Uh, we got map, filter, reduce, uh, so on and so forth. Um, it almost becomes its own language where you have to learn the vocabulary and the concepts. And coming from this direction, Functional reactive is a very natural next step to me. Uh, the BaconJS documentation looks a lot like the underscore documentation. Uh, just in that, it presents you with this vocabulary for, for building programs, uh, which you can then combine and use in very interesting ways, much like underscore. Um, I actually think of Bacon as sort of a real-time underscore. And I'll get into that with a few examples later. Um, all right, now I'm going to show those examples. Um, all right, so the central primitive in functional reactive is usually called an observable or a signal. Uh, a lot of the libraries out there have this really incredibly dense documentation where they use all this funky terminology, but functional reactive is really about one thing, immutable streams. If you remember two words from this talk, it's those two words, immutable streams, because uh, it, it more accurately describes what you're working with. Now, a stream is pretty straightforward. A stream is just a series of related events and errors that may terminate. Here's an example of a stream. Uh, this is a stream of key up events, uh, which is very easy to generate using Bacon. Um, I hope this, uh, this diagram is clear because it's, uh, it's a timeline. Um, right now is all the way at the right, and you can see about 30 seconds worth scrolling by. Um, I just thought this was a, a nice way to demonstrate um, the way a stream works. So these are, these are Bacon events. And a Bacon event can wrap any kind of JavaScript value. It can wrap a Boolean. It can wrap a number, a string. Um, here I've got them wrapping uh, jQuery key up events. Um, it, they can wrap objects, and they can even wrap other Bacon streams, uh, which is important. I'll get into that later. Um, streams can also have errors in them. Let's suppose for a second that this stream here represents a particularly unreliable weather API. Uh, we're getting uh, temperature information from some source, and the server periodically goes down. Um, so each of those x's represents the server somehow going down, or we can't contact it. Um, clearly, we didn't write offline first app. So, um, in uh, this, uh, if you look at it this way, you can think of a stream as basically a promise that can resolve or reject more than once. Um, so if you think about it, a promise, you have 
your function where you're doing something asynchronous, and then you have your success callback and you have your error callback. The only difference between any promises library and BaconJS is that Bacon might call those callbacks more than once. And also Bacon gives you these really useful uh, abstractions for converting between different streams. Uh, oops, I skipped one. So finally, here we got a stream that ends. Uh, I mentioned that streams can end. Um, when they end, they just, I mean, it's pretty simple. They just don't emit any more events. And um, you can handle this differently in your application depending on what you're doing. So we've got another weather report stream. Um, I've gotten rid of the errors. Uh, maybe we refactored our server or something. Um, I mean, really, this is all just random numbers. But uh, suppose that this is temperature. So this is going to look familiar to anybody who has used underscore, which is hopefully everybody. Um, you just take our stream and we filter it, um, except instead of getting a collection out of it, we get another stream. Our original stream hasn't been altered at all, but we've just got a new stream with only the events that we're interested in. Um, I'm miserable when it's cold out, so I just decide to ignore values that are if it's colder than 41. So um, that's how I wrote my filter. I'm also using the ES6 arrow functions. I hope that's OK with everybody. It's, it's much nicer to read uh, bacon when you use arrow functions. So now I take it. I use another familiar function. I use map. And um, I add the little degrees Fahrenheit symbol on the end. And now we've got a stream of strings. And we can take this and we can update a div on our page. So in three quick lines, we've gone from some kind of weather event stream um, to got rid of the events that we're not interested in. We formatted it, and now we're spitting it out onto a page. What a sign does is it'll just call a method on a div. This is just straight up jQuery. Bacon doesn't know anything about jQuery for this particular call. It's just calling the HTML method on the jQuery object that it's selecting. Um, I've used map. Uh, there's also reduce. Um, reduce also has a parallel in BaconJS. Uh, it's got two parallels, actually. One of them is called scan. Uh, we've got a, string of, a stream of numbers, and if we scan over them, whoops, that's not a number. Um, uh, if you scan over them, um, then you get a second stream where each number is just the sum of all the numbers leading up to it. Um, oh, I forgot to give it a starting value. <laughs> um, there's also another function called reduce, which is uh, much more familiar to um, underscore users, where it'll just give you a single value when, when your first stream closes. Uh, these are both useful in different instances. Um, it just depends on what you're trying to do here. One point that I'd like to make about scan is that it creates a special kind of stream that Bacon calls a property. And a property is basically the same thing as a stream. Bacon handles it very similarly. Um, the only difference is that a stream is, like I said before, it's a series of discrete events where each event is its own distinct thing. A property is more of a continually changing value. So our first stream up there is a stream where each number is its own discrete event. The second one is a property. Um, so each event that you're seeing there uh, represents a, an updated change in a value. Um, so this is a, a small distinction, but it's it's important for certain parts of the Bacon API to understand it. Uh, we've got also a couple of um, ways that we can combine multiple streams. Um, there's a merge function, which does exactly what you would expect it would. It just takes two streams and just sort of slaps them, to get, slaps them together. Um, this is useful, for instance, if you have a search field. If you want to capture um, key presses, uh, if you're looking for the enter key or the search button click, uh, then you can uh, take both of those sets of events and put them on one stream and then just handle that one stream and run your search function there. Very simple. There's also combine, which allows you to run a function on the latest event from each stream to create your new events. Um, here it's describing the color from the first one and the number from the second one. Uh, anytime there's an event on either stream, uh, it creates a new event on our output stream. Um, uh -oh. Whoops. Um, all right. I'm not going to bore you all with the entire API here, but there is one higher level method that um, you have to understand if you're going to use Bacon effectively, and that's flat map. What flat map does is it, 
it takes a callback that returns a stream and it will take all the events from all the streams that that callback returns and put them all into one stream. Uh, that's, I know it's a little bit of a cryptic definition, but maybe an illustration will help. Here I've got a series of URLs. Um, let's say we're generating them somehow. We've got user input or some kind of timer. Um, and we, if we take these, now I couldn't do the CSS to make a timeline coming off of a timeline, so I just cheated and added a picture. So the yellow bubble on the top there is, pretend that that's our HTTP URL here. Um, if we map it with our just normal map function to an AJAX stream, because uh, remember, a stream is basically a fancy promise, uh, then we'll get a stream of streams. And we'll have all these sort of dangling events off of it, and it'll be kind of tough to deal with. But instead, if we use flat map, then we get our, uh, let's pretend that these are JSON responses. Uh, then instead we'll get our, our nice responses all in one stream. And this is the sort of pattern that I would use to uh, create that weather stream earlier if I wasn't using random numbers for it. So all this vocabulary, you get map, filter, merge, flat map, all that. Uh, it almost makes up a whole new language in its own right with its own control flow. The fact that you have this new control flow means that you have to really attack your problems in a different way. You sort of have to get into the, the FRP mindset um, you're not really so much thinking about past, present, and future, what just happened and what's about to happen. You're more thinking of what's going on over here, what's going on over there, because you're sort of always stuck in the current moment with FRP. Um, naturally, this is honestly one reason why you might, you might want to consider not using FRP, is because it does have a bit of a steep learning curve. Um, it's really awesome once you've mastered it, but uh, it's a little bit like, starting off with Vim or Emacs. So you're going to have maybe a couple weeks of just really crummy performance, and then you're going to suddenly just get it, and then you're just going to take off and smooth sailing, well, mostly. Uh, another side effect is that you also have to learn the vocabulary of Bacon. Uh, if you sit down and read through the documentation a few times, um, that should suffice. You sort of get a feel for the kinds of things that Bacon can, can and can't do. So pure functional programming is good if you're an academic, if you're studying. Um, computer science, but ultimately you really do want to have side effects on the real world. Um, yeah. So ultimately, the, well, the, the joke about functional programming is the reason that functional programming doesn't change global state is because nobody actually writes pure functional programs. Um, you eventually do have to have output of some sort. Um, as a result, you need to have some place in your application where you stop using functional programming and you start having some kind of global state. And if you're writing a backbone application, a really nice place to have that divide is between the internals of your models and collections and the externals. Uh, if you have BaconJS handling the sort of plumbing, then you can have your models just sort of automatically take care of themselves. You can have your views automatically take care of themselves and everything will just work. And you can just pass around those models just as you would any other and they'll just still continue to work. So now I'm going to go through a couple of recipes for combining BaconJS with Backbone. Some of them are good and some of them are bad. I'm starting off with the bad one. So this is just a stream of models. This is sort of the, I don't know, maybe a, maybe a first attempt at it. Um, this is sort of, why would you use Backbone if you're doing this? This is, um, <laughs> You lose all the event handling stuff on the models, everything, all the plumbing that we learned about this morning at uh, Jeremy's keynote. Um, this is not a great, uh, you know, you might want to just abandon Backbone if you, if you can do something as simple as this, but odds are you can't. Um, if you could, then you might not be using Bacon either. Um, a better way would be to use one model and just capture the change event as a stream. Uh, there's a wonderful little library called backbone.eventstreams. It's a file that's about this long but you include it in your project and it'll, um, it'll just add this as event stream. It'll add a couple of other BaconJS goodies to your backbone items and um, you can get these wonderful streams just from a single call. Um, this model is very simple, or this uh, method of updating your views uh, is very simple and if you use something like this to update your views, um, then it's probably very familiar. So this would be the, the vanilla um, updating a vanilla backbone way of doing it. 
uh, the bacon version would be more something like this, where you capture the event stream, and then every time you see an event, you would render. Uh, this is useful for updating your views, but um, it's also useful if you have multiple people uh, potentially editing a resource, and you might want to prevent conflicts. So instead of saving, uh, and actually just thought, of, honestly just thought of this during uh, Greg's talk, the offline first. Um, if you have an offline first app, um, and you save all your events, all your change events to local storage, um, when the app comes back on, it can just push that list of events up to the server, and the server can decide how to handle any conflicts, uh, kind of like a like a git merge type thing. Um, or to go back to the view example, uh, if you want to avoid updating your entire view, um, you can just do something like this and have um, only listen to events on a single field and create a stream from that. Now what I'd like to say about these samples is that the way that they are right now is you would probably never write them um, because they don't actually do anything. I mean, if you look at um, the model.onChange line and then the model.asEventStream line, it's longer, it's a little more unwieldy, you have all this bacon stuff that you have to deal with, um, so why would you do that? And the answer is that uh, in case you want to refactor it later, in case you want to change things, like let's say you have a counter on your page, uh, let's say you have, you're counting some kind of an event and you're testing and this event only occurs maybe every two seconds or so. So you write your code, you add streams in there just for the heck of it, and you push to production. Well, it hits production, and your users start using it. And suddenly you find out that this counter isn't updating every other second, it's updating dozens of times per second. So your, you know, your browser starts to sweat, your CPU fan goes up, and what do you do? Well, if you weren't using bacon, you'd probably introduce a variable at the top, you'd probably keep track of when the last update was, on every update, you would check how long it's been, see if it's been beyond a certain interval. Um, and that'd, that'd be probably maybe four or five lines of code with a lot of um, room for error. If you're using BaconJS, though, uh, Bacon actually has a very nice throttle function. So you basically just throttle based on how many milliseconds you want minimum between events. And so that way, you can say, OK, well, I just want to throttle it to every 250 milliseconds. So suddenly, uh, your UI gets much snappier. Um, you're only updating four times a second, but maybe you don't need all those all those updates that are making your browser sweat. So you, what you lose in terms of time spent learning Bacon JS, you gain in maintainability and flexibility of your code. One of the coolest things, you, oh, responsive design folks. Uh, that's better. Uh, one of the coolest things you can do is there are a, a handful of ways that you can combine um, BaconJS with WebSockets to sort of transparently have your streams available on either side of server versus client. Uh, this is one pattern that you can use to communicate changes in the model directly. Um, Bacon also has a, a handful of other functions for converting from a callback or converting from a node style callback. Um, there are quite a few ways that you can actually handle streams across that server client boundary. So when you have a stream on your server and you have it handled in this way, you can actually um, take that same stream that you have on your server and do all your mapping filtering on it on the client. Or perhaps you want to throttle it on the server before you send it to the client. Uh, if you spend maybe 20 minutes playing around with it, it's a really cool technique. Um, and it's, it's a lot of fun that you can just sort of freely flow between uh, server and client side if you're using Node. All right, I'm going to demo making a simple chat app. Uh, suppose you've got an API like this one that's already been written. Uh, in reality, we'd probably use WebSockets for this, but um, I just want to use this for an example. Um, also, the chat app is just going to be one big chat room just for the sake of simplicity. So here, uh, so here's the, uh, the chat thread um, collection. It's how we're representing the collection. Uh, it's a little complex. There's a lot of bacon going on in there, but um, I'm going to step through it step by step. Uh, this creates a property that always contains the timestamp of the last update with the server. You can see we're just capturing the request event as a stream, and then we're using scan to convert it into 
a new date. Um, so that way it'll always contain a current timestamp. Uh, if you notice before on the, uh, the filter example that I had, um, all the streams that you create from a particular stream, it always occurs simultaneous unless you're doing some sort of delay or throttle. It'll always be simultaneous, so that timestamp is always going to represent the timestamp on our request. Um, this is very simple. It just creates a stream of empty events, and it's just basically a heartbeat. Every two seconds, it sends out an empty event. Now, here's where we get into the cool stuff. Um, we take our last sync property, and remember, a property is a continuous value, so we can sample it between events because it always holds on to its value until it changes. So we take that value and we sample it on that heartbeat. And we, so now we have a stream of timestamps, where each timestamp is the timestamp of the previous synchronization with the server. You take that and you map the timestamp to a URL, um, as the API documentation had a couple slides back. Um, and now we're sort of in familiar territory. This is the, uh, the slide that I cheated and used the picture on. Um, you take that URL and you flat map it. Um, manually trigger the request because we're sort of bypassing the synchronization um, only because this isn't really a, a create, read, update, delete app. Um, this is uh, more sort of sending discrete items. Um, and then we return our AJAX request as a stream. And so that, that AJAX stream is going to emit one event which is going to be uh, an array of JSON items representing the messages uh, that occurred since the last update and then the stream's going to end. So now we have an array, or no, a stream of arrays of JSON objects. We take that, we just map it to our message model, um, which I'm going to demonstrate in a moment, or just show the code for it in a moment. Um, I messed up the indentation there a little bit, but um, the, uh, this is very, fairly straightforward. And then uh, you take that result and you call the push function on your collection. So the this context up there um, refers back to the collection. And um, so now in a, just a handful of lines, we've gone from taking our heartbeat, mapping it to a URL with the last timestamp, um, take that, create an AJAX request, um, create a stream of AJAX responses, map them to our message model, and then assign it, uh, or rather push it into our collection. Uh, here's the message model. It's very simple. That's why I, oh, I forgot about that. Um, so here's the demo. Um, you don't need that functionality for, um, for this part of the demo. I've got a few bots that are on there that are going to join in a second. But um, the, uh, uh, the essential functionality for receiving messages is in place. So now I'm just going to add the, model, the sending functionality. Uh, I'm not using streams here. Um, you probably want to listen for an error or something here. But uh, this is just a simple post request. Um, so then the view actually uses uh, that merge functionality that I talked about to combine the enter key presses with the send button clicks. So we take the key up events and we filter um, based on 13, which is um, enter key code, and you merge it with the click stream. So now, Now I can use the enter key or there we go. And the delay is because of the polling. So now because I've merged them, I've I've combined these events into a single stream that I can handle in a particular way. Um, oh yeah. CoffeeScript goes very, very nicely with Bacon JS. Uh, because CoffeeScript is uh, sort of designed for um, functional, it's ideal for functional programming, and that's exactly what BaconJS is. So any program that you write in JavaScript um, is going to be absolutely gorgeous if you write it in CoffeeScript. Um, maybe just a, so maybe some of you have heard of it. I don't know. Um, so if any of you are looking for more information about this, uh, I've got a few resources for those of you who liked my talk, those of you who didn't like my talk. Um, this is uh, the best 
explanation of functional reactive programming that I've been able to find. Um, a lot of the other explanations are um, really dense. They, they sort of cram a lot of terminology in there. But um, this is actually a gist on GitHub. I love that people are posting these sort of blog posty things as gists. I don't know, it just makes me happy on some level. But um, uh, I'll post these links on Twitter afterwards. Um, and this is actually, this has a lot of diagrams. It uses the RxJS library for its examples, but uh, it's very easy to follow no matter what library you're using because um, it's got diagrams. It's actually where my, my static image diagram came from. Uh, the BaconJS documentation is, of course, a great place to look. Uh, it's got plenty of examples. Um, RxJS is uh, the implementation that I mentioned that the, um, the intro uses. Um, uh, if you're not a huge fan of BaconJS, but you're still interested in playing around with Reactive, then um, I would advise checking this one out. Uh, these two are really interesting. Elm is a, a little language that compiles to JavaScript and HTML in your browser, and it's designed for functional reactive programming. So you don't so much have uh, variables, you just sort of have streams as the primitives. And it's a very interesting way of looking at it. Um, the programs are a little dense to read. Uh, you have to practice a little bit. Uh, they read a little bit like Haskell, uh, which is not very well. But, um, but they are beautiful little programs. And there are a couple of really cool demos with it. Um, there's also, uh, a few days ago, Matt's creator of Ruby um, published, um, I think it's just a specification. I'm not sure if it was the full language. But um, information on a, a language that he's working on called Stream. And Stream basically, um, uses uh, bash pipes as sort of a metaphor for functional reactive programming. So you take your streams and you can use the, the pipe to sort of um, go from one item to the next. Uh, it, it looks a little bit Ruby-ish, but um, it's also got sort of bash mixed in there. It's a very interesting way of thinking about it. Uh, finally, for those of you who just aren't interested in functional reactive at all, there's um, uh, con what was it? communicating sequential processes. I, was, I can't never remember that acronym. Um, and JSCSP is a particular implementation of it. Uh, if you play around with um, ES6 generator functions, uh, then this library might be fun for you because it, uh, it sort of brings a little bit of the flavor of Go routines to, um, to JavaScript and lets you, um, lets you use sort of uh, that style of programming. So that is basically the whole presentation. I think I'm out of time. Yeah, okay. Um, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to come find me, and uh, thanks for your patience.